Father, tonight we we stand in your presence. We thank you for the breath that came to the dust, caused man to become a living soul. And tonight we pray that that breath would touch each one of us. Those of us that feel like we've failed you and far from you, that your breath would carry the love of a father's heart. Those of us that feel like we're confused, standing alone and we can't see past our own circumstance, that today, tonight, we'll gain a glimpse of the purposes that you have in store. We pray for those we're standing next to. We pray a blessing over them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Now, come on, somebody close to you needs a hug from you or a high five. Come on, give someone a hug. We're in church. We're allowed to do that. Thanks, Elijah. I appreciate that, man. Wow, what an honor it is to be here on Wednesday night at The Rock. Love it. How many uh, were here last time I was here? Not everybody, but what an honor to be here and uh, be a part of it. I, I, I want us to go tonight to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up in the, verse 31. I believe we've got it on the screen, but Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. The writer of Hebrews says these words. He says, it is a fearful thing to fall or to bow or to find yourself surrendered in the hands of a living God. I used to read that as a kid and I used to think, wow, you know what? I'm scared of God. It's not really what it means. What it means is when you get a glimpse as to who God really is, your breath will be taken away. You, you realize how formidable God is and the fact that God is with you, why is it that you've given in to some of the challenges and why is it that the enemy has had his way when there is such an incredible God that's got your back. And so the writer of Hebrews says it's a awe-inspiring, it's a liberating, it's a wow moment when you really surrender into the hands of God, when you stop fighting it on your own, when you stop trying to control it all and work it all out. And then the writer says in verse 32, but I want you to recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you suffered or you endured a great struggle of sufferings. Partly because you were made a spectacle by reproaches and tribulations and partly because you became a companion of someone who was so treated. In other words, you began your walk with God with such illumination. You had such expectation. You had such boldness. It was like, God, you saved me. You freed me from my addiction. God, you you, you put your spirit in me. Come on, Wednesday night. You, you reached down and when there was no answer for me, you gave me the answer. You illuminated my mind to realize that my past was not going to be my mentor. But actually the spirit of God was on me. And so I began to believe for great things. But then some stuff happened. I don't know if it happens in America, but in New Zealand stuff happens. It's kind of like I'm walking with God and stuff happens. Things change. I don't like change. I want to control what's happening around me. The unexpected just turns up and you go, God, if you're so strong, so mighty, why, why is it that I feel so weak? Why is it that right now I, I'm confused and I, I can't see past myself? I don't know who wrote Hebrews, but I would tend to think it was the Apostle Paul, if you align what is written to his life. Here I am serving the mighty God, but chained up. Here I am preaching that Jesus is the light of the world, but my cell is dark. And it's like, well, God, I, I thought you led me to this place. God, I, I thought you opened this door and I expected it to be easy street. Come on. And yet it seems to be the opposite. I, I feel confused. 
Then the writer of Hebrews in verse 35 says this classic verse. He says, therefore, because God is God and you know what it was to be illuminated. Therefore, because you've gone through some things, you don't understand why. Do not cast away your confidence. Let me put it in the New King James. When you're in Church of the Rock on Wednesday night, do not be quiet. Give the preacher some response. You say, yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor, what's going on in my life. No, I don't. But I know what goes on in mine. And when I began to read this some years ago, I was like, Paul, do not cast away your confidence. Why? Because you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Paul, recognize your confidence brings reward. Now, if that's the Bible, then you can be absolutely assured the enemy's going to attack you in the way you didn't think he was going to attack you because he knows you live confidently. Come on, you're going to open the door to more. You're going to see the promises of God become an actual reality. And so the enemy, you know, it's an amazing thing. I travel the world and, and I meet some great pastors that have been on the way a long time, but some of them has, have lost the sparkle. They might be in a different season, but they lost the sparkle a long time ago because the enemy is warring against you. See, there are three stances in our Christian life. By stances, I mean this. You're either leaning in. Heaven you know, when you meet a leaning person, what's the atmosphere like? It's like, how you doing? It's not, not bad under the circumstances. As I often say, what are you doing under there? Come on, you come up to someone, how are you doing? Oh, I'm not too bad. Think about that for a moment. I'm kind of not bad, 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 but I'm bad, bad, bad. <laughs> come on, seriously. No, I'm not saying life is easy, but I'm going, you know what God says? If you could develop a leaning. Oh. Well, things, things aren't going as... Expected, man, there's some difference. There's some, there's some dark cells. There's some chains. I didn't expect there's some confusion in the air. But, but actually, I'm looking for God in this. I, I'm looking at uh, what God's going to do through this. Because, you know, there was a time where Paul and Silas were in prison and they were in chains and, and, and they had rats peeing all over them and, and they were not in the place they thought they would get to when they were in Bible college. But somebody made a decision that they would lean in. They didn't feel like singing. They didn't feel like praising, but because they leaned in. Listen, not only did their chains come off, but everybody in the prison. And I don't know if there's been a time in history. I don't know if there's been a time in history. Come on, the world needs the church. Let's stop pushing, putting our finger at the world and say, boy, it's a dark place out there. San Bernardino is getting worse. Stop pointing the finger. Start leaning in. You see, we're going we're gonna to develop this stance in life where it's like, well, I don't have all the answers and it's not always easy. But one thing is I'm waking up and I'm going, I'm going to see what God's going to do today. I'm going to expect God to do. I'm not going to cast away my confidence because the Bible says confidence brings reward. See, the second stance we have is not a lean in, it's a lean back. Well, I, I don't know if I agree with it all. I've been doing this a long time. I've become a little bit cynical now. I'm confused. I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. Oh, yeah, I know God's real and I'll be at church, but let's see how good Elijah sings today. Because if he's not on form, I'm not even list, lifting a finger today. Come on. Well, preach it to me, white boy. Let's see what you got. Come on, people like that. How many agree with me? You need to slap them sometimes. 
So if we're all leaning back, nothing would happen. Come on. The enemy wants you to move from a lean into a lean back. And all of us in different seasons of life, no matter who we are, no matter what title on the door, we'll go through the lean back, the lean in, or the standing idle. It's kind of like I'm not leaning back, but I'm not going to commit just in case God doesn't turn up. I'm not sure if I can trust it fully. And it's kind of like I look at this and I feel like God is saying, and I felt tonight stirred that we here at The Rock and all of us as Christians need to live what I call a lean in life. And if you're watching online tonight, it's the same thing. God is looking to you. He, he, he doesn't just see people in church. He sees all of us. And he's going, where's your lean? Is, well, what happened to your lean? Have you got your lean on or are you leaning back or are you just going, well, I'm not, I'm not really negative, but I, I just don't want to get too committed, so I'll just stand idle. And the Bible says the idle man is neither hot nor cold. Going to end up smelling of vomit. What does that mean? Going to end up living a sick life. Whoa. Do you know you can live a sin life, but you can also live a sick life? And it's kind of like, no, 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 no. We're going to get back on the front foot. We're going to begin to believe that God is doing something. I read recently that Pastor Banning from Jesus Culture said, do you know what? He believes. He believes that if God were to stop moving like he's moving right now and did nothing for a hundred years, in a hundred years time, we would look back across the globe and say, there has never been a revival like was taking place then in the history of the world. And you can be locked into your little location and go, you know what, it's just tough around here. But do you know right now in Africa, four times the population growth are finding Christ as Lord and Savior. In New Zealand, we have never seen the health of the church like it is. Across Australia, the church is growing faster than ever in human history. And I just want to challenge you tonight that there is something the enemy will use is when it doesn't look like it's happening for you, that you adopt a lean back position. Or you just stand idle and go, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to go forward or back. I, I just want to take it easy. And God says, no, no, no. You've got to actually lean in because revival... My definition of revival is the receiving and the releasing of breath. Like we did just before I preached, it's kind of there's a moment where if you're open to it, you could receive something of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Do you know the Holy Spirit's all around you? He just can't get through the distractions. But revival is not just the receiving of breath on an altar call. That's the problem in the church. We just want more breath. We just want more breath. We just want more breath. No, revival is the receiving and the expelling of breath. There's a guy called William Truebridge two weeks ago in New Zealand broke the world free diving depth record. I don't know if you saw it. No tank, just a wetsuit. He's trained for it. He's on the surface. He is supported by floating things around his neck and under his legs. And he almost goes into a subconscious state before he dives. He's going to attempt to break the world record and he's going to dive to 334 feet in one breath. Turn around. Take the tag off what has been positioned down there and come up 334 feet. So a total of 668 feet on one breath. Sounds impossible. They showed us before he went down that he practices, apart from being fit and training for the event, a thing called lung packing. And basically it looks like this as he takes his breath, he lays back with his eyes shut slowing his heart down to the slowest he can get it. And he's like this. When you feel like you're full, he keeps going. Smaller and smaller breaths until his lung capacity is so huge that it's well beyond what is normal. And then he turns and goes down 334 feet. He takes the little strap and he comes back to the top, breathing out. And he broke the world record. 
The point I want to make is this. You don't take ground unless you learn to breathe in something from heaven and take a lean in to expel it and breathe it out. There would have never been humanity if God didn't breathe his breath into the created dust. There would have no creation had been made if he didn't breathe out. Did you know you can't breathe out, sorry, breathe in when you're speaking out? And he said, and God said, let there be light. And God said, come on, let the sun and the stars and God said, He had some deposit of God, but he began to breathe out. And the enemy is wanting for all of us to lose our exhaling, our leaning into, our step into. Come on. And we think what we're going to see is our problems will fix up if we just come to church and get more ministry on the altar call, more word, more breath, more breath, more breath. You need the breath of God. I'm not discounting that. But if you don't breathe out, you don't get back to the top. And it's like God, I think, is preparing the church for something like we have never seen before. That God is realizing that our prophetic edge is under attack. Come on. It's kind of like the world's trying to shut us down. It's preaching tolerance. My Bible tells me we are the light of the world. How many know light brings reaction to darkness? And it's kind of like, well, you can't stay what you really think today because you know what? You're going to have everybody picketing outside the church. You're going to have everybody attacking you. And I'm telling you, we don't have to be against any people, anyone that is created. But we need to realize there's a spirit at work that's wanting to take our leaning away. And I want to encourage you. It's time for you to lean in and say, no, no, no. I am a child of God. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Our children are being taught. You know what? You don't know who you are. You're going to just try and see who you really are. In fact, society across the globe, you are what you feel. Well, thank God. I'm not what I feel. Come on. Can anybody join me with that? It's like you, 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 if you are what you feel. My, my younger brother grew up when he was a little wee boy. We used to talk about what we'll do when we grow up. He said, I'm going to be a fat old lady on a motorbike. Well, thank God he didn't live out what he felt. No, serious though. Hey, I've, got, I've come tonight to tell you, you're not what you feel. You are who God says you are. Feelings are good, but I'm no, I'm not what I feel. I, I'm not, I had to live this out and say, God, you've got to actually change me. I, I, I want to see the power of light come upon me and begin to change me. As I said, Hebrews 10 verse 35, we put it up again. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great, everybody say great. Great. That's pathetic. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great great reward. Some of you are going to go home tonight and go, you know what, honey? We kind of allowed our marriage just to get stagnant. I'm coming home, I'm going to be a great husband. And whether you like it or not, you're going to be a great wife. Well, been through a few battles. It's all right for you just to hype us up on a Wednesday night. Come here, let me slap you. You got the God that created the universe living on the inside of you. You've got to stir that up and realize, hey, I've got to live a lean in factor. I've got, to, I've got to live the kind of life that's not just sitting on the edge. And, you know, I grew up believing God could. I grew up believing God was good. But then I had to learn if I didn't lean in, come on, revival could be happening all around me, but it wasn't touching who I was. I've got some good news tonight. You began. Your life with a lean-in factor. You don't have to be gifted or talented to get the lean-in. When God deposited you on this earth in your mother's womb and you came out as a kid, you had the lean-in factor. Do you remember those days where you couldn't crawl? And your parents were saying, I wish 
Little Paulie would crawl. I'd never done that before, but I had the leaning factor. So I began to try it and then I could do it. Come on, it was the leaning factor that caused me to stand for the first time a little wobbly. But I was doing something I'd never done before because I had the leaning factor. When I walked and fell over, hit my head on the coffee table and all of my uncles and aunties clapped. Because I'd walked for the first time, I had the leaning factor. I wonder tonight what could happen in the next 12 months in your life, in your ministry, in your church, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your world. If you began to realize, you know what? Wow. Wow, I've been through some stuff and I didn't realize the enemy had worn me down. So I keep reminding him I had that leaning factor back then. If I had it back then, you got to watch out because I'm going to lean in even more now. I've also realized that I determine the angle of my leaning. Pastor, would you pray for me so I get a better leaning? Nope. Do it yourself. Come on. You've got to determine. I've got every reason and more why I shouldn't lean in. Because of the stuff that I've seen and I've been through. But you know what the Bible says in verse 25, uh, 35? Therefore, do not cast Away your confidence. Here's the revelation. Nobody took your confidence from you. Come on, you're at home online. I'm a little dark down here, but just see me by faith. Nobody took your confidence. It's a lie from the devil. The devil used people, devil used circumstance, but the Bible says you cast it away. So we spend our lives telling why we have a right not to be leaning in. But here's the good news. If you cast it away, you can get it back. And I believe the church should be amongst the most, not arrogant, but the most confident people on the face of the planet. Come on. The Bible says in Isaiah 40 verse 31, those that wait on the Lord shall shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings, with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. I always quote that verse when I'm on the treadmill at the gym. (laughs) They will walk and not faint. Come on, somebody. You say, yeah, but I can't get my confidence back. It's because you're not waiting on the breath. You get the breath of God, but then you've got to bring the breath. Revival is not just the receiving of breath. That's a misdemeanor. That's what causes revivals to die. We just want more breath, more breath, more breath, more breath. Come on, you need the breath of God to go to depths you've never been before. But to complete the purpose of God, you need to bring the breath. Come on, some of us need to bring the breath tonight to our families, to our places of employment, to the places we study in. And begin to realize we've got to live with a leaning factor. I love how the Amplified Bible phrases Philippians 4 verse 13. It says this, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Sounds pretty arrogant, that. All I need is Jesus. No, you don't. If you don't have the breath of Jesus, you're on your own. But once you get the breath of God, then he needs your breath. Because if you don't lean in, you're not going to get the breakthrough. Come on, somebody. And I look at that and I go, okay, God, because this for me has been a key part of who I am. And you go, well, how do you get your confidence back? If I was the one that cast it away, how do I get it back? I want to give you just four keys to living a lean in life, to really living with confidence. The first is this, is that all of us must understand whose image we are. See, it's an amazing thing that the enemy uses the most practical things to cause us to release and let go of our confidence. Whose image you are. I was made according to the Bible in the image of God, in the image of him I was created. So why is it that I look at myself and when I see that I don't have what I think I need, 
that I let go of my lean-in. When actually if you believe the Bible and you read the Bible according to the way it's written, I am the image of God. In other words, the image is the mirror. So we spend our lives going, if I get good enough, if I feel good enough, if I have what I need, then I'm going to be able to do what God wants me to do. And God says, no, you're my image. You will never get righteous enough. You have my righteous robe. But I need you to deal with your sins so that you can be covered with me completely and stand as a mirror of me. And so the enemy attacks our lean in by attacking who we are and how we see ourselves as practical as that. And how we see ourselves depends or determines our lean in. I spent much of my life going, I love God and God can do it. But man, I ain't got what is needed. I stuffed up there and that doesn't really work. That didn't work out. And so I might as well give up. You know, Psalm 139 for me has been a lifesaver. Verse 13, David writes and he says, God, it was you who formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. How many love this? I will praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. You know what? That scripture is not like, God, I was covered in my mother's wombs and your works are marvelous when I look at creation. The whole context is you and your human form. I am fearfully, original language, I am awesomely, (laughs) made, And my soul knows it. My thinking knows it. My feeling knows it. And I don't believe that actually we've spent enough time to allow the truth of this to really settle in our hearts because with it, we begin to lean in like we've never leaned in before. I think what the psalmist was saying is, church, realize this is once we accept our reflection, it's then that we begin to shine. When you stop comparing yourself with everybody else, come on, when you stop comparing what went before or what you saw over the fence and you stop looking at your older sister and say, I wish I was as beautiful as her or or I wish I had those talents or gifts. When you stop comparing and begin to accept your own reflection, you're going to have a lean in in your part of life that's going to change the world around you. You know, people look at me and say, well, it's all right for you, pastor. You got it all together. You don't know my life. Seriously, you don't know where I've come from. I think I was about five or six years of age at school and I had fair skin. We went out in the sun one day. This happened one day. And in, under the sun, I didn't know it was happening because you can't see your own face when you're in the playground. But my whole face got covered with frickles. And my friend go, what's wrong with your face? I said, what do you mean? He said, you got all these brown spots. I said, get out. He says, have a look. I ran home, had a look in the mirror, and I realized I was covered with freckles. Now, you might not think that it's a big thing, but when you're about five or six, I remember going to the bathroom and getting mum's scrubbing brush trying to scrub this brown stuff off. Why did I do that? Because there was something different about me. I think I was kind of in my, before my teens, and I had shorts on, because we all wore shorts to school, and Another friend said to me, Paul, your your legs are skinny, mate. I said, what do you mean? Your skinny legs? I said, well, my mum's legs are like pegs. So are yours. That came into here. Bang. They're okay now because I work out. But they were like pegs. But what went into my heart? I was like, really? Really? I went home, I looked at them, I don't know for how long that night, and they were skinny. I didn't wear shorts again for four or five years. Only when I had to for sport. See, the enemy knows that if he can attack what you don't have, he'll stop you leaning into what you could have. Oh, somebody got to write that down. And then my friends in our teenage years, they all started to mature. And I saw them changing for sport lifting their arms up and under their arms they started to grow hair. 
I don't know if you remember this stage of life. And I'd go home to the mirror and there's nothing. Went on for weeks, nothing. I said to one of another mate, I said, you know, you got that hair stuff going on, eh? And he goes, yeah. He said, you got nothing. I said, nothing. And he just looked at me with a deadpan face. He said, you got a massage. Massage under your armpits. So here I go as an early teen, every night, every morning, massaging my armpits. About a month and a half later, I go, there's still nothing. He said, oh, if that doesn't work, you need to get plant fertilizer. So I went to the garden center, true story, got plant fertilizer, put it under there, massaged it in. It took all the skin under my arms off. Yeah, you laugh. For me, it was trauma. I never tried hard at school, sport in those early years because I didn't like the shape of my legs. I didn't feel like I fitted in because I didn't have hair and other people did. At 19, my hair starts falling out. It's an amazing thing, you know, it's kind of like, why? I didn't realize back then it was just biological. My dad was bald and my mum's side was bald and I didn't have much chance. And it was like, but I spent at least 10 or 15 years, every time I went into a big shopping center where there were big mirrors and lights on, I would always look to see what was happening. And then you hear someone say, oh, that bald boy over there, it looks like, and something would just go into your heart. Come on. Hey, it's the same if you've got a bit of excess weight and you've got a slow metabolism. Come on, you don't have the looks of a, a sister or a brother or something like that. Even one day I said to my mum in sports, I said, all the guys can touch the floor stretching. And I said, I can't. And she said, son, I need to tell you something. And I thought, oh, no, not something else. <laughs> she said, you have got high hips. Most men have hips around the belt line. Actually, my hips biologically go up all the way to there. They actually touch my rib cage, believe it or not. I've got very high hips. So my legs are incredibly long. If I'm in a plane, I find it very uncomfortable, but I'm very short-waisted. It's okay until you're at school and the teacher goes, hands on hips. You want me to tell you more? <laughs> My mum was one of the first mums in a hospital. They had a superbug that was killing mums and babies. So they sterilized the ward. Mum was one of the first mums back in the ward after they had sterilized and I was born. They didn't get rid of the bug, so I contracted the bug. And I had a growth under my chin here, little wee baby. They decided to operate, mum said, before I was four months old. Otherwise, I would have died. So they cut me open and they took the bug out. Unfortunately, they obviously got it all because I'm still here today. But they sewed me back up underneath here. There's a scar. And in fact, I was at the restaurant tonight. When I eat, particularly if it's spicy food, but even when I eat, this leaks. Drips down my, my chin here onto my shirt. Just leaks. So I'm always doing this. You might think that's no big deal, but how many know I'm weird? I can drink a coffee and drink it again. <laughs> my ears don't line up. The different shape, you never noticed that until I told you that. And now that I'm getting old, I was on a motorbike a, a year or so ago. And even on a motorbike, you have your helmet on and how many know your cheeks are out. My, my skin's so flappy, it just sort of gets like, like big sails now. <laughs> you say, why are you preaching this stuff? Well, what I'm preaching is this. The enemy will use what you don't have or what's weird about you. That's why David said, I got to learn to accept myself if I'm going to have the lean in. Come on, I've got to learn to say, hey, I, I, I'm the image of God. I'm not the image of you. Come on, doesn't matter if your teeth line up or they don't line up, if you end with hair or no hair. You got high hips, low hips. Come on, you're a little taller, a little shorter, a little wider, a little thinner. Who gives a rip? God made you in His image. And when you begin to realize that, you begin a lean in factor that changes everything. Come on. Because the enemy, get this, the enemy wars against your potential 
by attacking your personhood. It's as simple as that. And I wish I would have understood that a lot earlier. I would have had a lot more leaning. I seriously, I used to go to the mirror and go, mirror, mirror on the wall. Why am I the ugliest coot of all? But now I go to the mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. You're the luckiest mirror of all. You wouldn't be able to afford this mirror. Come on. I'm too sexy for my body. I'm joking, but I'm not. Because if you don't start thanking God for you, the enemy's already got you on the back foot. I don't have to be you. You don't have to be me. Come on. We are designed by God to be who we are. Second key, if you are going to get your leaning back, your confidence back, you've got to, what I believe is commit to decisions of enlargement. Stop living small. I just completed a book last year called Failure Freedom. Nobody ever taught me I should have a failure theology. So I spent my whole Christian life praying, God, I don't want to fail. God, I don't want to fail. God, I don't want to fail. You know what I pray now? God, I'm prepared to fail more than I've ever failed before. Because failure and sin should not be in the same sentence. If you sin, you get right with God. Tonight, some of you have come to church. You need to get right with God. Leave this place knowing that God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. He will forgive you and you can move on with His Spirit in your life. But if you want to do what God's called you to do, you're going to fail all the time. And if you don't get comfortable with failure, get out of the way. I'm telling it like it is. Well, what if it doesn't work? Who gives a rip? If it doesn't work, you'll learn from it. Do you know in science, there's no such thing as a failure. Everything is called a lesson. That didn't work, so we know something because of that. Come on, if we're going to reach the future that God has for the rock, let's be people that commit to decisions of enlargement. And by the way, don't allow others that won't be prepared to make the big steps to actually stop you from doing what God's called you to do. Daniel eleven thirty two. the people that do know their God will be strong and do exploits. You can't have the breath of God on the inside of you without the breath of God coming on the outside of you and doing what you've never done before. Oh, I pray that a spirit of faith gets you tonight. I really pray. 1 John 5 verse 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will that he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, we have whatever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Come on. Some of you got to make bigger decisions. Get your leaning back in. Come on, Pastor Dan and Jess, we're behind you. We're going to lean in. We're going, to get, we're going to put a shoulder to this next season, this next thing that God's calling us to, and we're going to see things like we've never... Thankful for the past. We honor the past, but it will pale into insignificance about what you're going to do because we're going to lean into this. We're not just standing idle, and we're not leaning back. If you're leaning back, the devil's got you already. Start leaning in and say, come on, we're in. Number three, accept the lean-in challenge. You're going to take a big step, but the challenge is going to come. You lean in, you're going to make mistakes. Well, who gives a rip? You know, don't be somebody in the stand that says, I told you that was going to happen. Get on the field and realize anybody that's going to do something makes a mistake. Because the devil says, see, 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 yeah, yeah, you got that wrong, you got everything else. No, 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 no. Hey, I realize if I'm going to be a lean in life, if I'm going to get out of the boat and start walking, there's going to be challenges that come. I was in a conference once, one of the first conferences. My pastor asked me to introduce the speakers. I was as nervous as. And he said, just all you got to do is introduce the next speaker. Get everybody to stand. There's only a two-minute break, three-minute break. Tell them not to go to the bathroom because we're going straight into the next session. So I'm sitting there getting real nervous, sweating. Seats were hard like a bench seat. And, and all of a sudden, my right leg went dead. You know how you get pins and needles? And I'm kind of banging it, trying to get it right without anybody seeing. And the guy finishes early. So here I am, my first big gig. I'm sitting there, my legs, and I get up and it's like, it's all sort of numb, you know, and I'm trying not to. Wasn't that a powerful word? Come on, let's stand. Let's not go to the bathroom. Just have a couple of minutes. and We're going to go straight into the next speaker. 
Everyone stands up. There's a guy over there. He's also on a hard seat. And he stands up exactly the same. He goes like this. Oh. So I'm thinking this is the moment God's helping me out. So I go over to him. I say, sir, these seats are hard, aren't they? He said, they are. I said, man, you got a dead leg like mine. He says, no, sir, it's wooden. <laughs> Come on, if you're going to have a lean in, you're going to do some dumb stuff. <laughs> Don't stop there. Mate, I could keep you laughing all night about all the stuff that's gone wrong for me. <laughs> Preaching with my fly down, all sorts of things that have... If you, if you went there, it's like, it's amazing. But what I've realized, listen, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. Though he, though he, though he, sorry, you haven't got it. Though he, though he fall, though he fall, he will not be cast down. Hold it, back the truck up. God delights in his way. He delights in his rising. He delights in his falling. Who told you you weren't to fail? Why stretching to go into the purposes of God? Come on, Elijah and the team. I want you to join me. Number four, if we're going to keep our lean in factor, we, we need to understand whose image we are. Come on. Some of us have to go home tonight and say, Mira, you're the luckiest. You got me, man. You're blessed. I'm going to commit to decisions of enlargement. I... I'm going to accept the challenge when it comes, the lean-in challenge. But here's the final one. I've got to remember, if I'm going to keep my lean-in, that strength, strength comes from the breath of an all-loving, all-forgiving, all-powerful God. My strength is not in myself. In fact, there's some crazy scriptures. This one in particular. Paul, do you realize when you're at the end of yourself, you're weak, you've lost everything. At that point, my strength is most powerful. Holy Spirit talked to me at the start of this year. It kind of went like this. I love watching you. Because you're all in. If the mountain's big, you just get the shovel and you dig your way through it. You got a great lean in. But I'm asking you, would you give me the steering wheel? But God, you asked me to take away back then. You gave me driving lessons. And said you're on your own. Commit to a decision of enlargement. Now, now, I want it back. What? I want you to see what I can do. I can't explain in a meeting like this what God has done in the last 12 months at home. It's indescribable. Don't deserve it. It's like the breath of God. Now, I don't know where you're at tonight. But some of us, God's calling us to lean in and stop procrastinating. And others, God's saying, let go and receive my breath. And you'll begin to see what happens. But I want to challenge you that if we just stand still, we're a target for the enemy. And if we find ourselves leaning back, there's only one position that's okay. That's to receive the breath of God in a season so that you can lean in but for no other reason come on every head bowed if you're watching online at home I'm talking to you as well obviously do you know that God is all loving all forgiving and all powerful and tonight if you're here and you go if I was really honest hand on heart Paul I'm not right with Jesus Maybe you've never personally invited Him to be your Lord and Savior. Christianity is not a religion. It's about a relationship with a loving, forgiving, and powerful God. A God that sent His Son, Jesus, to die 
on a cross so that my sin could be removed forever. And I could know what it is to be free. I could know what it is to be forgiven. I could know what it is to have personally a relationship with God and to find His love, experience it. To know His freedom and to see His power at work changing me. And tonight, if you've never invited Him as your Lord and Savior, I want tonight to be that moment for you because if you ask Him, He'll change everything. It doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't mean you won't have times of darkness. But the difference is God will be with you as you walk through that. But God promised that if you'd invite Him into your life, He'd change everything. I've experienced that. Tonight you're here, or again you're online, and you've prayed that prayer before, but you're not right with God. Tonight I want to pray for you personally. I want this night to be a night where everything changes. And so in a moment I'm going to ask you if that's you. You're going to say to me, Paul, tonight I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never prayed a prayer to invite Him in to forgive my sin. But tonight I want to do that. I want to tell you, everything will change. You just come as you are. Or you know you're not right with God. You've walked away from God and tonight's going to be a turnaround night. You're going to get right with God and you're going to say, Paul, include me in that prayer. Come on, right across this building. And at home, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand so that I can see it and I'm going to pray for you. Just where you are right now. Come on, lift your hand up high. Say, that's me. I can see hands going up. Don't put them down. Don't put them halfway up, put them all the way up. Come on, say, that's me tonight. I don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to say, that's me. God bless you over here. God bless you. 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 Right up on the back there, I can see you. God bless you. Lift them up high. Give me a little wave so I can see. I don't want to miss anyone. Come on, lift them up. God bless you. Right up on the back over here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you here. Come on, this is a night where God's saying, if you'll respond to me, I tell you, my love will touch you and my forgiveness will remove the guilt of sin. You say, this is my night, Paul. I want to get right with God. Come on, somebody else. Lift it up high. Say, that's me. I don't want to miss you. Come on, hands up. Don't put them down. Leave them up. We're going to pray this prayer together. I want the whole church to pray it. I want you to join with me with your hands up. Say, God, tonight, thank you that you love me and you're prepared to forgive me. And I invite you to be my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we thank God for every one of those miracles? Come on, let's really thank God for each one of those miracles. You know what we're going to do? Listen to me clearly. There is no greater moment in any human life than getting right with God. And maybe you're here and you still haven't lifted your hand. We're not going to make you do it because if you don't mean it, it means nothing. It's kind of like God's offering everything, but you've got to receive it. And in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I want everyone, whether you've done it before or not, everyone that lifted their hand and those who didn't, but wish they would have. You can come with your friend if you're here for a first time or if you're here on your own. Nothing weird's going to happen. I want to shake your hand. And tonight, I'm going to tell you, your life is going to change because we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song, I'm No Longer. Come on, I want everybody that lifted their hand right now as we stand. Come on and sing that. I want you to get out of your seat straight away. Don't stay where you are. Come and shake my hand and say tonight. Come on. Come on right now. Come and shake my hand and say tonight. I'm making a decision that changes everything. Bless you, honey. Awesome. Bless you, man. Come on. I want to shake your hand. I want to make a decision tonight. God bless you. Come on, bud. Awesome, man. Love you, man. Just stand here for a moment. I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. Amen. Come on. God bless you, honey. Good, good. Come on, shake my hand. God bless you. Come on, sing it, church. Don't look. Say tonight. Believe in God. Good night. Come on, sir. So good. Bless you, honey. I don't want to miss anyone tonight. Come on, you still can come. You bless you, honey. Bless you, man. Are you coming tonight? Come on. Give them a great hand as they come. Believe God. Come and shake my hand. Come on. Come on, man. Awesome.
Love you, buddy. What's your name? Sergio, what a good name. Enjoy tonight. You know, you put God right in the middle, you're going to ooze with confidence. You've had a real battle in your brain about who you are. And it goes back, actually, to your childhood. There's a whole lot of confusing things. I can see it because God sees everything. And you know what? I want you to look at me. God wants you to know he made you you. And when you find him, you find yourself. And that's the same for everybody that's standing here. Amen. So good. Can I pray for you one more time? Father, I thank you. Come on, put your hands toward them. God, I pray for every person that's standing here. And I thank you tonight is a night of change. We give you the glory for that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you came with a friend, I want your friend to go with you. And we're just going to follow pastor over here. We want to give you something that's going to help you really understand what it is to build a relationship with God. We're not going to make you do what you're not ready to do. We don't do that. But God's going to turn your life around. Is that cool? God sees your tears and He sees the grief. But we're all with you. And you put God in the center of the mess. You know what God does? He turns it around in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's give everybody a hand as they just go for a moment. Just follow. Go together. Everybody go together. Come on. Give them a great hand as they go. Let's believe God for miracles and miracles.